<laughs> What's up, party people? You thought you were crazy to haul sand into your frat house for a beach-themed party? The hosts of the following blowouts would throw their specialty cocktails in your face for thinking you belonged on this list. It's the nine craziest parties in history. The stinkiest party on this list was Andrew Jackson's cheese party in 1837. In 1836, during a national tour, a New York dairy farmer presented President Jackson with the bell cow of his establishment, a wheel of cheese that measured four feet in diameter, two feet tall, and weighed 1,400 pounds. Jackson let the cheese age at the White House for a year. Then, during his final celebration as president, he decided it would be a Gouda idea to invite anyone so inclined to take as much cheese as they wished. The gathering was a blast, but Jackson's presidency is not well regarded. When he left office, people didn't cheddar tear. What can you expect when you cross a ballet with a boat party? A lot of people are gonna get pirouette. Things got properly wild in 1923, when Igor Stravinsky's Les Noches premiered in Paris that fall. To celebrate, party couple Gerald and Sarah Murphy threw the splashiest booze cruise you've ever seen. Guests on the River Seine that night included artists living in Paris at the time, like Picasso, who was so inspired by the table's centerpieces that they later influenced his art. The Murphy's Fiestas were such a big deal, they inspired the ones depicted in F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. Filmmaker Jean Cocteau dressed as a captain and told guests the boat was sinking but everyone was too busy watching a champagne-fueled Stravinsky dive through a laurel wreath, which apparently is the French equivalent of body slamming a table. Si, sophistique! Stand clear of the sequin socialites, please. Making a stop in 1975, when New York's hottest club was a subway station, the premiere party for Tommy, a rock opera film by The Who, was subterranean and the peak of 70s glam. Raging on the mezzanine level at the 57th and 6th station, guests like Elton John, Frankie Valli, and Tina Turner enjoyed oysters among the turnstiles. Bill Murray brought his pals Gilda Radner, John Belushi, and Harold Ramis through the back to become the most hilarious group of party crashers ever. From underground to high fashion, in 1911, Paul Poiret, nicknamed Le Magnifique, or the King of Fashion, was the most famous courtier in France. His laundry list of innovations included replacing the corset with a brassiere and creating harem pants, culottes, and the V-shaped neckline. Like a true king, he rented out a mansion on the outskirts of Paris for his thousand and second night soiree. The dress code for the evening was Persian-themed, and if you weren't properly dressed, you were turned away. Because unbeknownst to the 300 attendees, Poiret intended to put on a fashion show using the guests as the models. Ooh la la! Once suitably attired, entering guests passed by a giant golden cage where Poiret's wife and some friends lounged like human parakeets. Partygoers had their choice of listening to renowned actor Edouard de Max reciting Arabic folk tales or mixing it up in the garden with monkeys, parrots, and famous ballerinas. Out glitzing the fanciest fashion show is the party that was crowned the last great royal ball. In 1903, Emperor Nicholas II and Empress Alexandra threw the costume party to end all costume parties, literally. The fancy dress extravaganza took place on the eve of the economic crisis that would mark the end of Tsarist Russia. The party celebrated the 290th anniversary of the Romanov dynasty, and everyone was required to dress in their 17th century best. Court ladies wore dresses embroidered with precious stones and headdresses adorned with rare jewels, while the men donned richly decorated caftans and boyer-style fur hats. One of the Tsarina's outfits was valued at 12 million current U.S. dollars. If someone had been smart, they'd have brought a Tide stick and charged 100 grand to anyone who spilled red wine on their family treasures. Every October, the town of Marino in northern Italy hosts its La Sagra dell'Uva di Marino Wine and Grape Festival. What makes this party the pick at number six is the highlight of the festival, called the Miracolo, when the fountain in the town square begins gushing wine instead of water. 
However, in 2008, the eagerly anticipated Miracle Wine didn't come, and the disappointed Revelers' cups filled with lame old H2O. But suddenly, shouts of Miracolo echoed from nearby homes. Wine was flowing from their faucets. Turns out the Miracle was really an engineering mistake. Or was it? Oh, you think your Thanksgivings are wild because your aunt puts sausage in the stuffing and y'all play beer pong in the basement? Imagine pulling up a chair to the table at the Manchu Han Imperial Feast in 1720. The feast was staged as a celebration for the Chinese Emperor's 66th birthday party in an attempt to unite the Manchu and the Han people. Though there's some mystery surrounding whether the feast actually happened, it holds similar significance in Chinese culture as Thanksgiving does in America, as a celebration of two very different and opposing groups that came together for an elaborate meal. 2,500 guests gathered for three days of excessive eating and drinking. The menu was a mix of Manchu and Han cuisines and included typical items such as dumplings, roast duck and pig, and bird's nest, as well as exotic delicacies like bear paws, leopard fetuses, and monkey brains. And you thought you needed a nap after a few plates of turkey. Many events try to stake claim as the party of the century, but when couples are getting divorced over being denied an invitation, you know your party has earned a spot on this exclusive list. In 1966, at the height of his fame, Truman Capote invited everybody who was anybody to his ball, including Frank Sinatra, Mia Farrow, Lauren Bacall, Henry Fonda, and Candace Bergen. We're the only nobodies here, said Andy Warhol to his date. The party took place in the Grand Ballroom of the Plaza Hotel in New York City. Guests were required to wear exclusively black or white, and everyone wore masks that they all took off at midnight. Whoa, look at all these famous people, said the 540 famous people. The party was pretty, and Capote was petty. He had his guest list published in the New York Times to shame all the nobodies who claimed to have been invited but couldn't make it. Cold-blooded Truman. In June of 1520, the Field of Cloth of Gold, named for the tents made of cloth lined with literal gold, took the crown as the most lavish festival of all time and the craziest party on our list. Co-hosted by King Henry VIII of England and King Francis I of France in an attempt to ease tensions between the two nations, the gathering of 12,000 nobles was 18 days of the two young royals one-upping each other, ringing up a tab that would total $19 million today. Imagine Coachella combined with a renaissance fair for almost three weeks straight, with Kanye and Taylor Swift as the headliners who desperately want to murder each other. This party was so fancy, the servants had servants. Guests were entertained by athletic contests like wrestling, archery, and jousting. The menu featured swans and a dolphin. This gold-plated shindig even featured wine fountains and a giant dragon-shaped kite filled with fireworks. The party didn't really accomplish its goal since the nations were at war with each other less than two years later. So there you have it, the top nine craziest parties in history. What did we learn? Well, food and drink are a must, costumes are fun, and more fireworks, less fighting seems to be a good rule of thumb. All right, I'm exhausted. You know what they say, you ain't gotta go home, but you can't stay here.